Rani.
Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We'll be starting uh, on time, please, God, in a few minutes. Thank you for coming early. This was muted here for some reason at the bottom. So I heard him talking, so now where's the sound? He hasn't started. Oh. And what do you really want side by side speak? Oh, my, no, the whole screen. Yes, full screen. Mm -hmm. yes. You need to unmute yourselves, guys. Mute yourselves. Okay, we still got a minute or two. Can you hear me? Yes, Rabbi. Thank you. So uh, don't have to mute yourself yet, but uh, if uh, if there's if you're able to control that there's no uh, noise in your environment, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll have to mute everybody, but best if you can make sure that there's no noise coming from your devices or your room. Um, and later on, we'll be happy to take questions and you can uh, unmute yourself then. Okay. A minute to go. Do you see a text up here on the screen? Yep. Okay. Very small. Very small. No. Best I can do. Okay. If uh, those of you, uh, before we start, it's not necessary that you would like. Okay, so I still have to. Move you. Yeah, you must, Grandma. Okay, so um, it's not required, it's not obligatory or compulsory, but uh, if you like, if you have one handy, you can find the text in the Art Scroll Sitter. I'm not going to be focusing on text throughout the lecture, but I will just bring it to your attention. So um, the uh, 13 principles occur in two different forms. Animamin, I believe, in the Art Scroll Sitter, page 178. Or it's also in song form in a hymn called Yigdal that we sing every Friday night in most shuls, and you'll find that on the bottom of page 12 in the Art Scroll Sitter. But it's not necessary. I have it here on the screen share, uh, both Yigdal and the Animam in here, just the two principles that we'll be dealing with tonight. <clears throat> Okay. Right. Let's 
just an announcement before we start that uh, for those who are not uh, regular attendees of uh, Sidman Shul programs, you may uh, want to uh, sign up to some kind of communication system so you can know about uh, things like this, or if there's any changes in the program, which I don't anticipate, please God, but if we can communicate with you and you with us, it would help. So just now we'll be putting in the chat line a, uh, a link where you can- uh, No, it's fine, but I don't how, know how to get on the picture. You can choose how you would like to communicate on. with us. Okay, I've had to mute people. People who come in after I've muted everyone aren't muted. So please make sure that there's no noise in your environment, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So you can choose if you want us to communicate with you via email or via WhatsApp. Um, have a look at the chat later. It will give you the link. If you already get our communications via email or WhatsApp, that's fine. Don't worry about it. But uh, I believe we do have new members joining us now. So if you'd like further information and communication, have a look at the chat later. Now, okay, so welcome to the 13 Principles of Faith by the Rambam, Maimonides, the great Jewish rabbi, philosopher, codifier, and uh, author. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Rambam, Maimonides, very, very briefly, just a quick uh, life story introduction. Uh, he was born in Cordova, Spain, on Erev Pesach, 1135, over 800 years ago. At age 23, he began writing his commentary on the Mishnah while he was fleeing from murderous mobs who were trying to kill the Jews. So imagine you're running for your life and you have this presence of mind to be able to write a commentary. It's quite unbelievable. He completed it seven years later at age 30. His family moved to Fez, Morocco for a better life and a safer life. Later they moved to Israel, but then uh, he had to leave Israel and he went to Egypt. He was appointed the chief rabbi of Cairo and became the physician to none other than the Sultan himself. He authored Sefer HaMitzvot, a book listing the 613 commandments, the guide for the perplexed, the most famous Jewish work of philosophy. And uh, besides the commentary on the Mishnah, also the Mishnah Torah, his most famous work, which is the very first encyclopedia of Jewish law that we have. In fact, uh, it's what made him so famous and so special. Everybody speaks about the Rambam, Maimonides. There are so many rabbis, so many greats, but he was quite special. And it is uh, because of the Mishneh Torah that he wrote, which was the very first encyclopedia of Jewish law worked out by subject in an orderly fashion. Uh, the Talmud is the first encyclopedia of Jewish law, but it not, doesn't go by subject. There's many books of the Talmud, and there's lots of cross references. So for example, the, uh, the laws of Hanukkah don't have a book of the Talmud themselves. You have to look in the book of, in the Masech the Shabbos, in the book of Talmud called on Shabbos to find the laws of Hanukkah. Would you know that? Not necessarily. So the Rambam was the first with his encyclopedic knowledge of Jewish law of the Talmud and all commentaries he was able to put everything in an orderly fashion. He was able to draw from all the cross references throughout the whole Talmud and put it into an orderly fashion, the first encyclopedia of Jewish law known as the Mishnah Torah, the repetition of the Torah, uh, because he goes through the whole Torah, all the halachas of Torah. And uh, after that, it was easier for later sages to write the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, thanks to the Rambam who had made that first encyclopedia by subject. He passed away on the 20th of Teve, 1204, uh, just under 70 years of age. He was buried in Tiberias. And if you're ever in Tiberias, make sure you go and visit the tomb of the Rambam, which is quite an impressive uh, place. They keep uh, renovating it and making it bigger and, and better. And the original tombstone is still there, which has the remarkable epitaph. 
Mi Moshe ad Moshe lokom ke Moshe. From Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses Maimonides, to the great Moshe, the son of Maimon, the Rambam, there arose none like Moshe. That is unbelievable. You know how many generations of prophets there were after Moses? The great Talmud of giants. And to say that from Moses, 3,300 3, years ago plus, all the way to the Rambam, 800 years ago, then arose none like Moshe. It's an unbelievable statement, an incredible praise of the Rambam. Most people understand that, that in terms of codifying the law, he was uh, pretty unparalleled because of this first encyclopedia of Jewish law. So Moshe gave us the written law and the Rambam gave us the, the oral law in an organized fashion. So I call the Rambam a human search engine. Long before Google, there was the Rambam, a human being, a Jew, a scholar of unparalleled uh, depth and knowledge who was able to do what he did. Okay, now we're getting to the 13 principles of faith which were codified by the Rambam. First of all, since when are Jews into creed and dogma and theology. We don't hear much about that in Judaism. The rabbis are always telling us to study Torah and do mitzvahs. We, we don't have a whole belief system that we talk about all that much. That's true. It's not our emphasis because uh, we focus more on deed than on creed. Other faiths are always shouting, I believe, I believe. That's not our style. If but we given, do believe. If, if she's a virgin, uh, then she's given 12 months for these preparations. 12 months from. Okay, I will again ask sure that their environments are quiet. I have muted everybody, but again, people join us late and they're not muted. So please, thank you for your cooperation. Okay, so I said, we don't focus so much on creed as we do on deed, do, to do the right thing, but we do definitely have a Jewish theology. There is a philosophy and uh, we have a belief system. We may focus more and emphasize behavior more than beliefs, but a belief system we definitely do have in Judaism. And the Rambam was the first to codify them for us. And the way it came about is because when he was writing his commentary on the Mishnah as a young man, he came to the book of Sanhedrin and uh, the chapter called Chelek, which begins with a famous line that we read as an introduction to the Avot the Ethics of the Fathers, which says, Kol Yisrael yesh lehem chelet All of Israel have a share in the world to come. But if you look at the Mishnah in Sanhedrin, he then goes on to say, but there are exceptions. So as a general rule, it's true. We do all have a share in the world to come, but you could mess up. You could forfeit your share in the world to come, God forbid. And then he gives a list of people who forfeit their share in the world to come. And he speaks about people who are heretics, who are apikursim, who are non-believers. So we required a definition. Rambam is writing a commentary on this Mishnah. What is the definition of a non-believer? So he had to first define what do Jews believe? What should a Jew believe? What does a Jew have to believe to be considered a believing Jew and what beliefs do you have to reject to be considered a non-believer and thereby forfeit your share in the world to come? So therefore the first thing was to establish what is our belief system. <clears throat> now, you know, in Judaism, there's always machloikas, there's always arguments. Shammai says one thing, Hillel says the opposite. Abayah says one thing, Rabbi disagrees and so on and so forth throughout the Talmud. And many people, many commentaries uh, disagree with the Rambam on many things, but when it comes to the principles of faith, it seems that everybody is on the same page. They may have certain issues of details, famous argument between the Rambam and the Ramban, whether belief in God itself is one of the 613 commandments or not, 
But basically, virtually everyone agrees with the Rambam in his codifying of the 13 principles of faith. Later on, it was condensed into 13 sentences of animamin, animamin, I believe. We all famous, we know the, the famous song, animamin, about Mashiach, which the martyrs of the Holocaust sang going to their deaths. But there are 13 animamins, each one reflecting one of the 13 principles of faith. I believe with complete faith. I believe with perfect faith. And tonight we're going to do the first two of the 13, please God. So in the, uh, they took this commentary of the Mishnah and, and uh, shortened it, abbreviated it into 13 uh, sentences or paragraphs uh, beginning on Imam and I believe. Then later in the 15th century, the different opinions as to who the author of Yigdal was, that famous hymn that we sing in so many shuls on Friday night. Um, some other customs sing it at different times. But Yigdal is not just a little ditty, it's not just a little nice song to end the service on a Friday night. Uh, it is nothing less than the 13 principles of Jewish faith, of our Jewish theology. So it's not just a song, it is, represents the deepest philosophy of Judaism. In these 13 principles, five of them focus on God and how do we understand Hello. the identity of God. And the next, the next four focus on the divinity and absolute truth of Torah. And the final four speak about ultimate accountability, namely uh, reward and punishment. So as I said tonight, we, I hope to go through the first two principles so that we can, in the six week course, we can get through all 13. One of the weeks will have to go on uh, go through three of them. I'll choose the one that's easier to get three done in one week. But uh, tonight, the first two, and I have here on the screen share, I have on the left-hand side, Animamin, and on the right-hand side, Yigdal. So Animamin by Muna Shlema, I believe with complete faith, perfect faith, that the creator, blessed is his name, he, is the creator and guide of all created things. He's the leader, the ruler, not just the creator. And he alone has made, does make, and will make all things. That is the first principle of faith, uh, which in Yigdal we say, Yigdal Elohim Chai Etel acclaim or magnify, glorify, and praise the living God who exists beyond the boundaries of time. That is the first principle. The rest is the second principle. So um, let's see if we can uh, minimize that now. And we will carry on without that for the moment. I'll come back to it just now. Okay. Just get more of you on the screen. Okay. Where am I? Am I here? Okay, here I am. Okay. So, just give me one second. I'll get right back to you. Um, sorry, just trying to get the screen right. Pardon me, just give me a one moment. Okay. So, the first principle of faith. Um, as we said, is belief in God as the creator and ruler of all things. 
I'm going to give you a synopsis of Maimonides' commentary on the Mishnah very briefly, and then the Mishnah Torah. So he says, everything depends on God, and he depends on no one and no thing. If he did not exist, nothing else would, meaning God is completely independent. We'll come back to the idea of independence just now. Everything from humans to angels to the planets and the stars all depend on God and God alone. As it is written, Anochi Hashem I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, the first of the Ten Commandments. Uh, that is the source of the first mitzvah of the 613, according to the Rambam, to believe in God, that God is the creator. A short synopsis of Mishneh Torah. What does he say there? He begins his monumental work, his magnum opus, Mishneh Torah, the Yad Chazaka, his encyclopedia of Jewish law with four Hebrew words, Yisod HaYisodot, the foundation of all foundations, the Amud HaChochmot, and the pillar of wisdom is the realization that there is a first being who brought everything else into existence. And if he did not exist, no one else could exist. So, therefore, God alone is the ultimate truth, the only true existence and genuine reality. Jeremiah says in chapter 10, verse 10, he says, uh, Hashem Elohim Emet, the Lord God is true. He's real. God is the only true reality, the only real truth. We'll come back to that idea just now. His power has no end or limit. So to know, to know this, says the Rambam, is one of the commandments of the Torah, as it says, I am Hashem, your God. So a believer believes in God that uh, he is the master of the universe. A, uh, a non-believer denies the existence of God. Now, interesting, the Rambam begins with Mishnah Torah, he says, it is the foundation of all foundations and the pillar of truth, Leida. What does Leida mean? Not to believe. Leida means to know, to understand, to recognize that God is the creator and the one and only. But the Rambam, of course, argued that it is logical and rational to accept that a creator brought, brought the world into existence. It's not an accident of fate. It's not just a random big bang. Uh, the famous story of the king and, and, a, and a Jewish sage and the kings asked for proof of a creator. And uh, the uh, sage uh, painted uh, the, a, a, little, a little sketch, a drawing of, of the uh, view from the king's room of the mountains and the, and the, and the, and the river. And uh, while the king was out, he painted this little sketch. When the king came back, he says, oh, that's a nice sketch. He says, where did it come from? He says, oh, I spilled the inkwell onto the paper and this is what came out. The king said, are you Meshuggah? Are you crazy? What, what are you? It's impossible to spill an inkwell and get a beautiful sketch. And so your majesty, you don't believe that it can happen in two dimension, but you believe it could happen in three dimension. That beautiful world, I just did a sketch of the world outside with the mountain and the river and the beautiful scenery and everything. You think that just came because by accident somebody spilled the inkwell or, or, or the atoms banged into each other or something? In the words of the Talmudic sages, the jacket proves the weaver. The house proves the builder and the world proves a creator. Um, it is too to organize our universe to be an accident, to be random. Secondly, the philosophers and the Kabbalists insist that every one of us actually does believe in Hashem. If not outwardly, then in our kishkis, in our gut. How many stories have we all read or heard or experienced of simple Jews, ordinary folk, who gave their lives for their faith, whether it was in the Holocaust, whether it was in the Crusades, throughout 
Jewish history. Often people who actually said they don't believe gave their lives for God. Because when push came to shove, in a moment of crunch, when you had to make a, a, a decision, and in the Crusades, they had to choose between the sword or the cross, many simple ordinary Jews, even those who did not flaunt their beliefs or their faith, chose the sword and not the cross. How is that? Because we all have an neshama. We all have a soul. And that soul is a part of God himself. The pintalayit, that little irreducible core of godliness inside of us, which is inextinguishable. We may not be in touch with it. It may be latent and dormant, but it's there. And in that crunch moment, the truth comes out and we see that we actually do believe. So you can shout from the rooftops from today till tomorrow that you're an atheist, but we believe that you believe. So um, whereas a, a positive ID cannot be made uh, uh, of God, but we, we only can, can only understand what he's not, but we believe that we all believe. My father, Ola Shalom, told the story of his youth in Poland before he escaped Poland during the war, 1939. Germany had begun attacking Poland. They were, they had, the bombers were flying over Poland and dropping bombs and they had a bunker. And the siren went and everybody ran to the bunker. And in this bunker, you had all kinds of people. You had uh, Jews who were Hasidim with long payers. You had communists who claimed they didn't believe in God, socialists, Bundistan, all of them atheists. You had everything in between. You had all the extremes, the full, full spectrum of all kinds of Jews believing and non-believing in that bunker. Suddenly a bomb fell right outside the bunker, the loudest, most powerful crashing sound. You know what happened inside the bunker when that bomb went off right outside the bunker? Every single Jew inside did the same thing. They shouted Shema Yisrael with all their power. They thought the end was nigh. The Hasidim, the rabbis, the believers, the communists, the atheists, the socialists, the Bundistan, who were avowed atheists, they all shouted Shema Yisrael. There's no atheist in the foxhole when you see the truth. So we all believe. And therefore the Rambam says it's more than just to believe in God, it is to know. How do we know? We have to study. We have to reflect. We have to meditate on Jewish philosophy. We have to understand as much as a human finite mind can possibly understand about God and his uniqueness. So we cannot make a positive idea on God, he's too infinite, but we can try and understand what he's not. And some of that will be going through in the next couple of weeks. But we have to think about it. We have to ask questions, we have to read, we have to study. And uh, of course, to write books. I'll be happy to, to, to give you ideas if you ask. Um, we have to try to come to know, lay that, to know that there is a creator who rules the world who is such a, a, the only independent existence, not just to believe it, not just to take it on blind faith, but to try and understand as best as we can. So in South Africa, we have this term that you have to take a shtum powder. Shtum is a Yiddish word, which means silence, a silence powder. Don't ask questions. You don't understand why tragedy happens. Why was there a Holocaust? Why are people dying from COVID? Why are there so, many, so much suffering in the world? Uh, you can't ask questions. Take a shtum powder. Be silent. It's true that we don't have answers to these existential questions. These are part of the mysteries of the universe. We don't understand human suffering and tragedy. But neither should we be taking a shtum powder. Neither should we be just throw our hands up in, in resignation and say, you can't ask. You may ask, you're allowed to ask. If you ask with respect and humility, not with uh, rebelliousness and cynicism, but if you ask an honest, genuine question, seeking to learn, seeking to know, we will do our best to try and help us understand. Do I have an answer to the Holocaust? Of course not. But we can learn to understand 
why we cannot understand. And that too is an achievement. So even if it means to understand that we cannot understand, that has a lot of value. And that's beyond just taking a stum powder. So we have to ask and we have to try our best to understand, even if it means to understand that we cannot understand. Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Bardichit went to yeshiva as a young man. And he came home for Pesach. His father said, no, so what did you learn in yeshiva? What am I paying my school fees for? Let me get some money's worth. Teach me some wisdom that you acquired in the yeshiva. He said, dad, in the yeshiva, I learned that there's a God in the world. He says, what? You knew that before I sent you. I had to send you to yeshiva, I have to pay tuition fees to tell you there's a God. Even the Martha the maid knows there's a God. Martha, come here, Martha. Martha, you believe in God? She says, yes, sir, I believe in God. Lady Yitzhak said, dad, she believes. I know. That's the difference. She believes, I know. What he learned in yeshiva was not only to believe, not only take the blind leap of faith, but to know, to understand. Sometimes our experiences in life help us understand that. Some of you may have heard me say, when my first child, when our first child was born, I stopped believing in God. Rabbi, what do you mean you stopped believing in God? I said, yeah. When I experienced the miracle of childbirth in my own family, I stopped believing in God and I started knowing that there's a God. So that's the difference between faith and knowledge, between believing and leda, to know. There is a phrase we say in the prayer, Olenu, three times a day. Ein od, there is nothing besides God. Now, what does that mean, there's nothing besides God? That's what the Rambam is saying here. Basically, that he is the only true existence. Everything else is, uh, is, is, is not the true reality. So one of the ways we can understand this is that because he is the only independent, totally and completely and utterly independent entity in the universe. Therefore, he alone exist. What does it mean to exist? To exist means to exist independently. We are all dependent. Our next breath depends on Hashem giving us life. Whatever exists, exists because God created it and continues to cause it to exist. But only He is completely independent. He does not depend on anyone or anything for his existence. He always was, he always will be. And so therefore he is the only independent existence in the universe, whereas everything else is dependent on him. Therefore we can understand that ain't owed nothing else exists besides him independently. That's what one of the ways of understanding this radical term, there's nothing else besides him. What do you mean there's nothing else? I'm here, I'm talking to you, you're listening to me, we're here. What do you mean nothing else exists? There's no other independent existence other than God. And here we come to an interesting concept, which is called the concept of continuous creation. Now, once upon a time, God created the world. But he didn't just create the world and then he went on holiday. Where's God been for the last couple of thousand years? Oh, he's just uh, taking a break in Mauritius. No, God is involved. He created the world, but he continues to create it. Why? Because even if he walked away from the world, the world would cease to exist. For example, we just read the other week of the great miracle of the splitting of the sea when the Jews were spared from the Egyptians. So God took this great east wind and made it stand up like two walls and the uh, children of Israel walked through on dry land. 
they walked, they got there, the Egyptians came in, then the, the wind ceased to keep the water standing like vertical walls and the water came crashing down on the Egyptians. As long as the miracle of God was fueling the water to stand like a wall, it defied nature. As soon as he took away that powerful wind, it reverted to its original state of flowing horizontally, not standing like a wall. Similarly, the greatest fast bowler in cricket or baseball pitcher, if he'll throw the ball up, He's got mighty arm. He can throw it up higher than anyone else. But as soon as the force of his throw, his thrust, his pitch is spent, the ball will come hurtling down to earth because of gravity. How long can that ball being thrown defy gravity? As long as there's a power of the pitcher or the bowler to make it defy gravity. As soon as that force is spent, it goes back to its original state. God miraculously created a world from nothing. For that world to continue to exist, he has to keep fueling its existence. The divine word with which he created the world, the creative energy that God put into the world has to keep being there to fuel the world, otherwise it would cease to exist. It's not like when a sculptor who's a creative artist fashions a vase or a pot or something and puts it on the shelf and walks away and it still stays on the on the shelf. No. Says uh Tanya in Shariha Vamuna, that's called Yesh Miyesh. He created he or she created something from something else. The original matter, uh the clay was there. Then it, they just formed it into a pot or a vase. But God created the original matter, Yesh Miyai, and something from nothing. Creatio ex nihilo, it's called in Latin. And therefore, if he walks away from it, it ceases to exist. And so we say in the, in the morning service every day, that God in his kindness creates the world every single day. He recreates the world every single day, but not only every single day, every single moment, every single second. And nanosecond, God is putting his divine creative energy into the world. And if he were not, if he walked away, we would cease to exist. Now we can appreciate the concept of what we call the specific divine providence. That God has a vast eternal plan and he's watching over us and everything in this world. And it's all part of the great divine plan. His watchful eyes constantly upon us and everything in this world for it to continue to exist. It's all part of his vast eternal plan. He's giving us existence. That means we are on his mind. We are in his mind every second. So nothing is out of his reach, out of his gaze, out of his divine providence. We're all part of the vast eternal plan. And that's very encouraging. The good news is that According to the Rambam, it is a mitzvah to uh, believe in the existence of God. What's the good news? If it's a mitzvah and God commands us to, that means he empowers us to do so. So there's no mitzvah that we cannot fulfill. If he asked us to do it, he knows what we're capable, uh, capable of doing, so we can do it. If it's a mitzvah, we can do it. Even if we struggle with our faith, even we think we're agnostics, we're atheists, God forbid. Did you hear that line? We're an atheist, God forbid. We can still come to believe because it's a mitzvah. And therefore, we just have to dig a little bit deeper until we find that inextinguishable <clears throat> belief and faith that we all have inside of us. That takes us to the end of the first principle. And now let me try and get the uh, screen share back so we can go through the second principle. So here's the second principle, animamin. You see my cursor here, animamin. I believe the perfect, complete faith that the Creator, blessed His name, is unique, or uh, that He is one, and no uniqueness, no oneness like His 
exist in any manner. He alone is our God who was, is, and will forever be. In Yigdal, Echad ve'en yachid ki yichud on elam begam ein sof la'ach duto, most singular of all. He's one, Echad, he's one. And a unique oneness, concealed and yet also without bound. Okay, so second principle, God is one and his oneness is a unique unity like no other. So a quick synopsis of the commentary on the Mishnah by the Rambam, where he says he is one, but not one like other things, like physical things. He's one in a unique way. There is no other unity like the oneness of Hashem. And what is his source? As it is written in the Torah, and we say it in our prayers every day, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Mishnah Torah, <clears throat> quick synopsis, he says like this. If you should imagine that there is another deity, another God, you violate the second commandment of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. So now the simple meaning is that there's one God, not two gods, or three gods. There's no duality, there's no trinity, there's one, uh, one God, you know? Like the Jewish atheist who sent his son to a private Catholic school because they got a good matric there. One day the kid comes home from school and he starts telling his father, he learned about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And this Jewish atheist father gets so angry. He is furious. He goes ballistic. He screams and shouts at his son. I told you there's only one God and we don't believe in him. <laughs> okay. So, the simple meaning of Hashem Echod, that is one God and not two and not three. If you believe there's more than one God, you're missing the point. The deeper meaning is that God may show different faces but ultimately there's only one God. So Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hashem is one of God's names, the name of Chesed, of compassion. Elokeinu, Elokim, <coughs> excuse me, is another God, another name of God, the God of Din, the God of justice. And compassion and justice are two opposites. God sometimes shows us compassion, smiles upon us, gives us good fortune. Sometimes he's judgmental and judges us and gives us grief. There's not two gods. There's one God who does both. He has different faces. He has many attributes. He has all attributes within him. Is it contradictory? It's not contradictory. Both are true. It might seem like it, but the one God may show different faces. When he smiles upon us and when he frowns upon us in good times and bad times, it's still only one God. There's no two deities, there's no duality. It's not that the good stuff comes from God and the bad stuff comes from the devil. There's no devil. We believe in forces of evil and darkness, but that's for another discussion. <clears throat> there's no duality. There's one God and one Balabos. So when bad things happen to good people or good things happen to bad people, it's all coming from the one and the same God. Now I want to share with you a deeper interpretation of the unique oneness of God, that, there's a, that he, his is a unity like no other. When we say one God, it means much more, much deeper than just one God, not two. You know, if you look at the art scroll, Siddur translation of Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, it doesn't say what we, what I said before, what most, almost all the Siddurim have the same. Hero Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. The art scroll is different. Hero Israel, Hashem is our God. Hashem is the one and only. Not one, the one and only. 
Now you know where uh, late Saul Kersler got the name for his hotel chain, the one and only. From the art scroll sitter, Hashem is the one and only. Meaning, his is an absolutely unique oneness. One person is not a oneness. Why? I have two arms, two legs, I have a brain, I have a heart, I have a pancreas, I have an elbow. I'm composed of many limbs and many organs and many sinews and bones and skin and a million different things. God is a oneness so unique as to be completely unimaginable by our finite mind. So in Judaism, a non-believer could actually be someone who believes in God. But he believes that there's two gods. If he believes in God and he also believes in the devil as a, an independent entity, then he's not a believer, according to Judaism, even though he believes in God. For Jews, that's not kosher. For example, in, in Greek mythology, you have all these gods and goddesses galore, the god of the sea, the god of land, <clears throat> The god of war, the goddess of love, and so on and so forth. Dozens of gods and goddesses. They believed in God, the Greeks. But they felt that it was unbecoming for God to have to do all the little stuff. As Pasnit, they said. It was unbecoming for God to have to do all these little things himself. He does the big stuff. He's the master of the universe. But the little things... For that, he has gods and goddesses. He doesn't sweat the small stuff. For that, he, he's the chairman of the board or the CEO. But he also has heads of departments. He can't be the chief cook, cook and bottle washer and do it all himself, thought the Greeks. And Judaism says, God does big and God does small. God does infinite, God does finite. Don't sweat the small stuff. I got news for you. For God, it's all small stuff. You think infinite is impressive to God. Infinite and finite is both finite to God. God is beyond infinite even. I'm going to quote a famous uh, work from a great mystic, Rabbi Meir Ibn Ezekiel Ibn Gabai was a Kabbalist born in Spain towards the end of 1480. He wrote a book called Avodas HaKodesh, Holy Service. Listen to this one line he says, which is so profound. He says, if you limit God to the infinite, you have rendered him finite. I'll repeat that. If you limit God to the infinite, you have rendered him finite. Now, that's a very powerful statement. What it means is that he is equally at home and comfortable in the finite and the infinite. Which also means that God is a universal God, the big master of the universe. And he's also a personal God who cares about you and me and the small stuff. And the Baal Shem Tov went so far as to say that even a leaf that falls off a tree is also part of the vast eternal plan of God. So people sometimes ask me, Rabbi, God is so big. God is so grand. God is so infinite. He runs the world. He runs the universe. Do you really think it bothers him? Do you think he cares if I eat a cheeseburger? He has nothing else to worry about? Come on. And my answer is yes. God is concerned that you shouldn't eat a cheeseburger. God is the great universal infinite master of the universe, but he's also a loving, benevolent, caring, compassionate father in heaven who cares about each one of his children and each one of his creation. And yes, he runs the universe, but he cares deeply about you and me. He's a universal God, but he's a personal God. He's infinite and finite. And so you can pray to him for your daily needs, for success, for health, for children, for nachas, for a shidduch, 
for whatever it is you need because he cares and he listens. We'll speak more about prayer in principle number five. But that pretty much sums up what I wanted to share with you this evening with uh, the first and second principles of faith. And um, I, uh, I hope you uh, followed me. I thank you for joining me. I'm happy to take some questions if uh, you'd like to ask some questions. And again, I want to remind you uh, to look on the chat. And if you look on the chat, you will see a link for uh, communications that we can keep you posted on what's going on by uh, either by email or by uh, WhatsApp as you prefer. So um, I'll just uh, see if I can uh, give that to you in case, uh, do, you, do you see it there on the chat guys? Yes, Reba. You see it, okay, great. So anybody who'd like to, uh, to get communication to, uh, you can go to uh, www.sipshul.coza uh, forward slash communication and uh, we will communicate with you. Okay, questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask me a question. Can't promise that I have all the answers, but I'll do my best. I, I, would, I would say to you that, by the way, that the um, tonight's uh, the first two are arguably the most philosophical. So I do believe that it'll be, it'll be get, it will get uh, a little bit easier perhaps to, uh, to follow uh, as we go along. The others are not as uh, deeply philosophical, but this, these were the, the, the basic introduction. Okay. Questions? Comments? Rebuttals? We're open for discussion. You'll have to unmute yourself though. Anyway, it's nice to see lots of you. We had well over a hundred devices, which means we might have had over a couple of hundred participants tonight. So it's very gratifying. I did spend a lot of time preparing this and hope to do so for the next five weeks as well. And I hope you'll enjoy it. And this is really very important stuff that we all have to believe and understand so that we can all be believing Jews as we are, but we have to know what to believe. So we shouldn't, uh, you know, if you, uh, you, if you don't believe in something, you could believe in anything, which could be dangerous. So it's nice to see so many new faces and new names uh, welcome aboard, and we're happy to have you all. And I hope to get to know everybody better as we go along. Okay. Last call for questions. Otherwise, you can just uh, open up and chat to your friends if you like. I don't mind. Happy to keep the Zoom going. We don't have any limitation on our Zoom program. If there's no questions, that means I gave all the answers, right? I explained, I explained it so nicely that you don't have any questions. Is that it? Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi, can I ask a question? Yes, you may, please. I'm begging for questions. You, <laughs> you mentioned earlier uh, a list of reading material that you, you would give us if we were interested. Say that again, please. You mentioned that you would give a list of reading books to read, good books to read. Okay, I will, uh, God willing, I will prepare something. Uh, I, 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 I'll start with one, but um, I'll, I'll give a few as, uh, as we go along. For now, I'll tell you that there is a, uh, a modest uh, soft cover booklet by the late Rabbi Arya Kaplan, uh, called uh, Maimonides' Principles, the Fundamentals of Jewish Faith, or in Hebrew, Animamin. 
but I'm not sure it's in print. So I'll try and see what's available in print. And God willing, uh, in the course of this series, I will uh, put on the chat line some, uh, some, title, some bi bibliography for everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you for reminding me. And feel free to remind me. Thank you. Any other oh, questions? Very interesting and um, enlightening, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Someone else had a question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Can't see who's asking, but go ahead. Better that way. How, how do you answer to yourself or to others when they do ask this question, why good, bad things happen to good people? Just to say that I don't understand, is that an answer? Okay, so that's a whole lecture in its own right, probably a whole series of lectures in its own right. I wouldn't uh, presume to give an authoritative, uh, definitive answer to that uh, gigantic moral question now, but I will say something very, very briefly, and that is that what we try to help people understand is that there are no accidents in this world. Nothing is random. Life is not the luck of the draw. And God is good. Even when bad things happen, we still believe that God is good. We believe that God is um, completely potent and powerful. He could have stopped any of the negativity from happening. The fact that it did not was obviously for a reason. So whether it's a simple single soul uh, who experiences tragedy or it's six million tragedies and my father's family was all wiped out. So uh, I, I'm talking personally, whether it's one or six million essentially the question is the same. And the basic foundation, it's not an answer, but I'm giving you an approach. The approach would be that we believe in God, we believe in divine providence, we believe that whatever happens is part of the vast eternal plan. And the vast eternal plan is often unknowable, not understandable to us, but does that mean there's no rhyme or reason, no logic to it? Of course not. There is a reason for everything. Can we understand it? Can we decipher it? Not necessarily. One day we'll look back and maybe in this world we will see answers. Serious, okay, infinite questions you. until we get to the world to come. But for sure, when we get to the world to come, there we will see the infinite truth. And there we will see why things happen and why bad things, seemingly bad things, happen to seemingly good people and vice versa. We will begin to understand things one day. One day might be in this world. One day might only be in the next world. So we do believe that there is a reason for everything and there is a good reason for everything. Right now, I would imagine if God came down and whispered in my ear why the Holocaust happened, I probably would not understand what he was telling. It's probably too deep, too profound for us in our finite world to grasp something like that. That is something we may probably only understand in the world to come. But there are reasons for everything, and we believe there are good reasons for everything because God is essentially good. Okay, that's all I want to say about that question. And again, <coughs> it does require a, a series of lectures, and books and books have been written on that subject. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to have had you, and I'm very appreciative of your participation, and I hope to see you next week, Monday night at 8 o'clock. God bless you all. Thank you, Rabbi. You're very welcome. Thanks, Rabbi. Thanks, Rabbi.
Thank you, Rima. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. You are very welcome. Thank you, Rima. My honor. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. You are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. That's welcome. excellent. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I just have to work out how to. You know who Arlene Root 